Dedicated, determined, dependable. This is News 10 ABC at 11. Demands delivered. Protesters meet face to face with federal officials hoping to have their voices heard. What they're demanding coming up. Family displaced to fire at an Albany home. No one is hurt, but the house is ruined. But first, we begin with a storm tracker alert. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Elisa Streeter. And I'm Mark Baker. A mix of rain, sleet and snow is moving into the capital region. Take a look outside right here. And this is uh, 87 at uh, exit uh, 15. That's up around Saratoga. And you can see that it is slick out there right now with some snow, maybe even some sleet starting to develop. We'll be checking in with Cap here to the storm tracker update to see how, just how bad it's going to get this evening. But uh, obviously, you want to be careful if you're traveling outside this evening. Meanwhile, we've been dedicated to following our other big story tonight, the protest over the decision not to charge a white New York City police officer for the death of Eric Garner, an unarmed black man. For a second straight night, protesters took to the streets, but this time they took their message to the office of the U.S. Attorney's Office and demanded to be heard. The Sunday ABC's Marty Casper followed them as they rallied inside. He is live outside the U.S. Attorney's Office with more. Marty? Well, Mark, the number of protesters today was smaller than those that shut down the streets yesterday, but the message was still the same as was the mission. The National Plan of Action for From the streets of Albany to the office of the U.S. Attorney Richard Hartunian. Last night we were wanting to make sure that people knew that we were here. Now we want to make sure that we're being heard. Protesters with demands in hand marched up to Hartunian's office. We followed no cameras allowed inside the federal courthouse. They weren't listening to us. We came in, they told us that nobody could meet with us, no one was available. So they decided to wait until someone was. You no, know, we want someone now, we want to talk to someone now. We came all the way down here for a reason and we're not leaving until our reason is met. And believe it or not, they sat down and began singing this little light of mine. When we started singing, we suddenly had a representative out in five minutes. It was Assistant U.S. Attorney Thomas Spina who came out because he said, quote, their concerns are valid and fair. And I appreciate what he said. He heard our cries. He uh, was in solidarity with us. Spina listened as the group of 20 took turns reading their list of demands and vision for a new America. We just gave our list of demands. Among their demands, end all forms of discrimination, demilitarization of local law enforcement, end police brutality, ensure workers get a living wage, end what they call the prison pipeline of mass incarceration. We're talking about comprehensive transformation of the system that isn't working for any of us. Racial disparities protesters say are happening here. The racial disparities are not just happening in Ferguson or New York City or Oakland or Los Angeles. They exist here, and that's why we're out here in Albany. Putting down streets singing and making noise. Making noise does make things happen. Now the protesters say they plan to follow up and make sure the U.S. Attorney's Office is vetting their concerns. Assistant U.S. Attorney Thomas Spina says the concerns will be explored, passed on to U.S. Attorney Richard Hartunian, and then ultimately down to Washington, D.C. Reporting live in Albany, I'm Marty Casper for News 10 ABC. Well, thank you, Marty. Albany isn't the only place in the capital region where protesters took to the streets. These are pictures from Hudson. Thousands of people marched through the streets of Hudson. They held signs and chanted, uh, uh, changed, uh, enchanted, no justice, no peace. As you heard, similar protests were held in White Plains and Nyack tonight. But the bulk of the activity was in New York City, where demonstrators are now becoming more aggressive. Get the, whole down. the crowds bigger and at times more aggressive. From confrontations in Times Square to some protesters throwing bottles at police. I believe my officers showed remarkable restraint in the face of, in many instances, a lot of provocation. After arresting more than 220 demonstrators in New York City last night, the NYPD is standing by for another night of planned protest. The outrage over grand jury's decision not to indict an NYPD officer for Eric Garner's death still similar. This man should have been indicted. The chants growing louder across the country of Garner's last words. <laughs> Officer Daniel Penaleo maintains he heard Garner crying out that he couldn't breathe, so he hurried to get off of him. Also testifying before the grand jury that he did not put Garner in a chokehold, saying this was a takedown maneuver he was trained to do when suspects resist arrest. It's just not acceptable. Starting today, more than two dozen NYPD officers are wearing body cameras as part of a new pilot program. Program, something Gardner's mother tells ABC News she believes will be useless. I think it's a waste of time. <laughs> we had a video. 
it didn't sway the grand jury to get a, 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 a true bill. And the NYPD is also now retraining all of its officers on ways to avoid using physical force. Now, an internal affairs investigation into the Garner case also started today. All right, and now we want to head over to Steve Caprizzo and take a look at that storm tracker forecast out there. Steve? Yeah, Lisa, it's uh, getting pretty nasty out there. Greasy roads, icy roads, combination of uh, snow, sleet, and freezing rain. And this is going to be a problem uh, basically for the rest of the night. Winter weather advisories posted. Now, they have been expanded. They did not include the uh, Hudson Valley earlier this evening, but now it covers much of the capital region and the Hudson Valley till 1 a.m. Outlying areas through tomorrow morning, though I think the main threat will be now till about 5 or 6 a.m. The first places to go above freezing will be right in the Hudson Valley. So that snow sleet line close to Albany and just north of Albany, slowly shifting northward, but still watch for pockets of freezing rain, even uh, you know, during the pre-dawn hours, most areas around the capital region should be rain 2 to 4 a.m. Temperatures will rise between 1 and 3 degrees overnight. Now, up north, up towards Lake George, still some icing early Saturday morning. But Saturday, basically periods of rain. There could be a break mid-morning. Then another round of rain could end as a quick burst of snow tomorrow evening between 6 and 9 p.m with another quick coating on the roadways. Here's the uh, Storm Tracker HD radar. All these colors represent a mixed up forecast. The uh, pink represents some sleet and freezing rain. The same thing with the purple. Snow to the north. Notice it's just getting in to Bolton Landing in extreme southern Hamilton County. And the green represents a pretty large area now of rain with pockets of freezing rain as well. So here's a bigger picture of the northeast radar. We got quite a ways to go through for the next, uh, say, three or four hours before it gradually uh, tapers off. So bottom line is a uh, use caution overnight. 31 in Albany. Temperature has not budged since six o'clock tonight. We've been stuck at 31. It will go up a little bit over the next uh, few hours. All right, uh, tomorrow, uh, periods of rain after the ice tonight, a low near, uh, high near 40. In Sunday, partly to mostly sunny breezy, a high of 33. We'll have much more on the forecast and tell you about next week's storm later in the newscast. Elisa. Thank you, Steve. An Albany family is spending the night away from home after a fire destroyed their house just weeks before the holidays. Flames erupted late this afternoon inside the home on Slingerland Street. Firefighters had a tough time putting this one out. News 10 ABC's Rachel Young Kunis has been on the scene since the beginning. She joins us live on Slingerland Street with the latest. Rachel. Elisa, authorities tell me this home is a total loss. The extent of the damage so severe. Crews are actually in the process of demolition right now. Fortunately, though, no one was seriously injured in this fire. It's Don't just a, a very again. stubborn fire at this point. Smoke swallows up a home of six on Slingeland Street in Albany Friday afternoon. Deputy Fire Chief Joseph Toomey says the fire broke out on the second floor just before four o'clock. Only two people were inside and they were able to get out safely, but the relentless flames burned for hours. Between the ceiling and the roof, there's a void space there that we need to try and get to because that's where the fire is. Fire crews battled the blaze from all angles, pouring water into the top window. But the layout of this floor is small and tight corners made it difficult for firefighters to combat hot spots. Very small hallways. We had trouble maneuvering through those. Crews work well past sunset and water begins to seep out of the cracks in the home. Power lines start drooping down, coming close to the flames. So National Grid has no choice but to kill the power to the entire block, keeping crews and neighbors out of danger. We had flames coming right where the service goes into the building. So we did have a concern early on that if the flames burned the wires off, they'd be live on the wires would have fallen onto our trucks. And you can just see how much damage the second floor suffered from the fire. Six people were living in this home, three adults and three children. They are all being assisted by Red Cross at this time. Now, we do know that the fire started on the second floor, but police have not confirmed what exactly caused these flames. Of course, we will bring you all of the updates as soon as we have them. 
for now. Live in Albany tonight, I'm Rachel Yankunis, News 10 ABC. Thank you, Rachel. A Fulton County community is mourning the loss of a good neighbor and former judge in Perth tonight. A fire took the life of 72-year-old Charlie Smith this morning. Fire officials say former Perth Town Justice and Councilman uh, Smith was killed early this morning when his home on McQueen Road went up in flames. Charlie Smith was able to get out along with his wife and grandson, but then fire officials believe he went back inside to try and save his pet and never made it out again. The community has begun collecting money, clothes, and household items for his wife and grandson. One of those donation sites is the Hageman Barbershop. Oh yeah, we've already had responses here today. There's people's already given donations without us even saying anything. They've just come in wanted to help out. It's awful, it's awful. I'm gonna do whatever I can to help the family. And the barbershop isn't stopping there. This coming Wednesday, every single dollar earned from haircuts at the Hageman Barbershop will go to the Smith family. New details, police in Gloversville say after they received word back in April of a man having sex with an underage teen, he fled to Pakistan. Well, police say they obtained an arrest warrant for 23-year-old Naveed Rana, but he was nowhere to be found. So fast forward to today. That's when the police department says Rana's attorney made arrangements for his client to be arrested. That attorney uh, directed this person to uh, surrender himself to the Gloversville police uh, today, which he did. And uh, the, he was arraigned in front of the Gloversville City Court judge. Rayna is now charged with rape and sexual misconduct and is in the Fulton County Jail. A Clifton Park man will spend up to six years in prison for menacing a New York State trooper. 45-year-old Douglas Stewart was sentenced today following an incident in August of 2013 when troopers responded to a Clifton Park neighborhood where there were reports of Stewart with a rifle. When they arrived, Stewart pointed a rifle at one of the troopers, placing him in imminent fear of injury or death, and the court saying that trooper fired his rifle a split second before Stewart fired his hitting Stewart. The Saratoga County Acting DA says this case demonstrates the difficult and dangerous situation members of law enforcement can face each day. New details about the man police say choked a woman inside a home and forced her to swallow a pill that could cause an abortion after she told him she was pregnant. Authorities say 44-year-old Thomas Pfeiffer is a licensed anesthesiologist from Red Hook. Pfeiffer was charged with strangulation, assault and committing an abortional act. Coming up on News 10 at 11, an explosive case and now a sudden reversal. Why this, the Rolling Stone magazine is now apologizing to its readers for misplacing trust in a woman who says she was gang raped. Plus, Bill Cosby launches a counterattack, filing his own lawsuit against one of the women accusing him of sex abuse. Those stories and more when News 10 at 11 returns.
You're watching Elisa Streeter, Mark Baker, Chief Meteorologist Steve Caparizzo, and Sports with Liana Bonavita. This is News 10 ABC at 11. Victims of sexual assaults are being remembered tonight by a group of high school students in Virginia. They lit 100 candles and held signs to encourage survivors to get justice. These students say the message of the vigil is peace and equality. It's about women's abuses, but more than that, about making women equal to men. The vigil wasn't the, or was at the University of Virginia, a college in the midst of its own sexual assault scandal. School's president says UVA will continue to look at how victims are treated. Now that scandal is now in question following a shocking apology by Rolling Stone magazine. The magazine published the story of a female student who claimed to be gang raped at a fraternity house. But the magazine's editor says there are now discrepancies in her story and that their trust in her was misplaced. Some students say even if the story isn't true, they're glad it came out. I think the general consensus was that even if it's not real, it's a problem. Even if that particular story wasn't real, it's probably still a problem. So as much as it matters that the, the article is telling the truth or not, I think we should still just focus on the problem that it brought up. Rolling Stone's editor admitted the reporter never reached out to the accuser's alleged attackers. The fraternity says they also found inconsistencies in the article. The alleged victim says she is sticking to her story. Los Angeles police are meeting with a woman suing comic legend Bill Cosby. She claims he sexually assaulted her when she was 15. This is Cosby launches a counteroffensive attack against her latest allegations. In a new court filing yesterday, Cosby making his own accusations about Judy Huth, the woman who filed a lawsuit against him this week claiming he sexually molested her at the Playboy Mansion after serving alcohol to her and a friend. 17 women have now come forward with similar claims against the 77-year-old actor in recent weeks. Thursday, the L LAPD chief of police said he will investigate new claims brought to the department regardless of the statute of limitations and whether it has run out. Getting pretty slippery out there. Let's check back in with Cap. Yeah, and this is the uh, beginning. It's going to be a long duration storm, but most of the ice tonight. And then watch out for Tuesday. Here's Chief Meteorologist Steve Caparizzo with your Storm Tracker forecast. All right, welcome back, everyone. Here's the deal. We're getting a lot of reports now, many, many reports uh, from my spotters and posts on Facebook. The roads are iced over. Any roads that are not treated 
are extremely icy, sleet, freezing rain, and as you go north of Albany, uh, there's still uh, some uh, decent snow and sleet mix. So, bottom line is, you got to be careful. Use caution if you're traveling. Give yourself plenty of extra time and a lot of space between you and the vehicle in front of you. It's going to be that way overnight in a lot of places. All right, tomorrow morning should be rain here. Now, there's still going to be some icy areas, especially up towards Glens Falls and Lake George. Uh, 34, so a very slow temperature rise overnight. Showers at noon, then the rain picks up in the afternoon for a while and uh, a temperature reading of 38. So there might be a temporary lull for a little while. All right, look at the temperatures near or below freezing just about everywhere. Now, the exceptions, it's interesting. Sometimes uh, you see this with the southeasterly airflow that actually some of the high elevations in western New England tend to be a little bit milder, not much, but in this case, one or two degrees uh, above freezing. 29 in Clifton Park, that's not good. Same thing in Troy. Notice Grafton up on the hill, a little bit elevated, a little bit milder, 32 compared to the low spots. Uh, 30 at Scotia. I'm going to go through a lot of temps because this is crucial. Look at uh, Whiteface, up around Whiteface Mountain. It's warmer, 35, high elevation. The warm air is coming in aloft. 28 at Scroon Lake, Lake George. 29 at Saratoga Springs. 30 at Broad Alban. Still some cold air, though, in the mountains of Vermont, at least for now. Uh, Bennington, 34. West Arlington's dropped to 32. There's still going to be some pockets of sleet and freezing rain in Western Mass, uh, 29 at Peru, 33 in Lanesboro, and 33 at Great Barrington. Cold air trapped in, moisture riding into that uh, cold air, so we got uh, the mixed bag, snow, sleet, freezing rain, capital region northward, rain and pockets of freezing rain as you head southward. That's going to persist into the early morning hours. Here's the storm south of St. Louis. It will track along the Ohio River, then eventually south of New England, and that will drag in a little bit colder air Late tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow evening. I'll tell you what that means in just a moment. Now, tomorrow, another wave of rain comes in, mainly rain for everybody. And then tomorrow evening, this is at 5 p.m. Notice that burst of snow along I-88 with the back edge and that cold air. So we may see a little shot at some snow tomorrow night to coat the roads, 7, 8, 9 o'clock. Then the dry air moves in, so we'll clear out for Sunday and be back to a lot of sunshine, though it's going to be a windy and a chilly day. So again, ice and mixed sleet freezing rain, trending towards rain over the next few hours, less than a tenth of freezing rain accumulating. Now the quicker changeover will be to the south, but still there'll be some pockets of freezing rain. Now sleet and snow may accumulate an inch or two, just to the north and west of Lake George, the mountains in Vermont, probably even south of this, down to, into the central and southern greens, followed by a tenth of an inch of freezing rain. The end result is not a lot of snow, more ice than anything else to worry about. Tomorrow, above freezing, upper 30s to near 40. Even Adirondacks will be in the uh, mid-30s, up towards Speculator. Amsterdam, 39 tomorrow, so everything melts tomorrow. 40 at Manchester, 43 at North Adams and at Great Barrington. All right, your forecast, the icy mix transitioning to rain from south to north. That snow and ice mix continues as you head up towards Saratoga, Lake George, Adirondacks, 32. Temperatures will go up a little bit overnight. Periods of rain tomorrow, the ice to the north will come to an end. A high near 40, a little bit of a changeover, burst of snow at the tail end during the early evening hours. Seven day forecast, dry Sunday and Monday, cold weather 33 and 34 respectively. Storm threat increasing Tuesday. All the computer models now guys are saying it's going to happen. That's a change from two days ago. So snow or snow and rain Tuesday, lasting into Wednesday. Wednesday would probably be cold enough for all snow. And then scattered snow showers Thursday and 33 and dry and chilly on Friday. Mess tonight, be careful, and we got to watch Tuesday, Wednesday very carefully because mm. it's going to be a much bigger storm than this one is tonight. All, All right. right, thanks so I much, guess. Steve. Well, it is the season to light up holiday trees, both big and small. One of those bigger ones was in Vermont, why one local man was thrilled to be there for the tree lighting. But first, here's a look at what's coming up on Jimmy Kimmel Live right after you stand at 11. Thanks. Take a look at what we made just for you tonight. Oh, you're scared to fly. You know what I am, Jimmy. I am. So what do you do? How do you handle it? Do you medicate yourself? No, I flying? don't.
The Green Mountain State getting in the holiday spirit as Vermont State House has its Christmas tree fully lit right now. Last night, Governor Peter Shumlin turned on the lights in Montpelier as a crowd watched and carolers sang. We first told you about this 32-foot balsam fir last week when it was picked up, cut down from Don Keelan's property in Arlington, which is in Bennington County. Keelan told us he planted hundreds of fir trees more than 20 years ago on his property. And after a couple of years of trying to get the state to notice his personal forest, 2014 turned out to be the right time when the 24-year-old tree was selected to represent the entire state. And there it is, fully lit up. And New York will be lighting its own holiday tree this Sunday, and News 10 ABC will be there. Lydia Colbita will be emceeing the event alongside Christina Arangio at the Empire State Plaza. There will be a holiday celebration all day Sunday, and the lighting ceremony begins at 5.15 with fireworks to follow. A lot of basketball arenas are using many blimps to advertise or engage with the crowd. Well, one blimp at the Portland Trailblazers game decided to engage their fans in a, in a different way. Take a look at this. That is an inflatable car. It's stuck in the stairwell there. The Ford blimp was flying around the arena when, get this, the engine blew. Well, so the blimp landed on the crowd. Crews couldn't deflate the blimp, so they tried to get it out through that stairwell. But as you can see, a little too big. <laughs> <laughs> Was anybody riding Should in have that? measured that first. Yeah, All right, probably. let's head over to Liana. <laughs> hey guys, well, if there was a roller coaster in the Times Union Center tonight, the Santa Men's basketball team was certainly on it. Highs and lows in the conference opener. We'll show you how the game ended up next in sports. Welcome back, everyone. Conference play tips off a brand new season tonight for the Siena men's basketball team. The Saints hosting Quinnipiac, the best rebounding team in the nation. Head coach Jimmy Patsos was disappointed with his team's effort against Fordham on Monday, but the energy much better tonight. Tight game in the first, Javion Ogunyemi. In for the easy dunk, the Troy High grad at 11 points tonight. Siena up two at the half. Saints start the second on fire. LaVon Long hits the jumper, part of a 10-2 run. Siena opens a 10-point lead and build on it. William Brandwick buries the three, and then the next play, he throws down the alley-oop. The freshman had 15 points off the bench. Saints go on to win it 89-67, but not all was good. News 10's Josh Shims has more. Josh? 
So the Saints get a win in their MAC opener, but it's bittersweet. Another blow to their front line as junior forward Brett Bisping leaves with a dislocated toe. He's out for a month, but head coach Jimmy Patso says that just means the next guy has to be ready to step up. Patrick Cole's going, and I think Himes is going, and Ryan Oliver is not afraid to rebound, and Poole is playing as hard as I've seen Poole play, and, and we'll, we'll get it done, you know? We, we have to play. We have depth. We can go small. We can go big, but, you know, I think Willem will, will get the chance to go in there on what he's done. Willem, he had a great game, and he stood up. When Jay fouled out, he, he stepped up, and a whole team was just in it today. With the time I got to show myself that way, it was it was unbelievable. It was like, to be honest, it was like a dream come true. You know, like it, it was it, playing the Times Union Center and all those people and the fan support was just unbelievable. Next up for the Saints is a road trip to Ryder on Sunday. Tip for that game is at 2 p.m. Reporting from the Times Union Center, I'm Josh Sims for News 10 ABC. Thanks, Josh. Well, it was an exciting night for the Siena women's volleyball team. The Saints taking on the defending national champs Penn State in the opening round of the NCAA tournament. Now, Siena has never won a set in five previous appearances in the tournament, and they put up a fight in the first set tonight, but it's not quite enough. Siena is knocked out of the tournament in the first round, three sets to none. Well, the epic five overtime semifinal between Gilderland and Columbia last year likely can't be beat, but it makes for an interesting storyline heading into tonight's rematch. Storyline eh, falls flat, though. This game, all Gilderland. Andrew Playtech and Ralphie Simeone combined for 42 points, and the Dutchmen win again, this time in regulation, 68 to 46, the final. Now, over at Catholic Central, the Crusaders return one of the best scores in Section 2, and Anthony Mack opened it up against Albany Academy tonight. It takes a junior a few possessions to settle in, but he starts to feel it on both ends of the court. Check out the block. Oh. But you know what? The cadets just, they keep going outside, draining one three-pointer after another, and Academy goes on to win it 76 to 65. Strong! <laughs> in your face. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you have a safe weekend. See you on Monday.